Here are the objectives for, uh, Cordae, for the file of Cordata. You can stop the video and have a look at these. And if you can do these at the end of the video, then you're pretty well on your way to getting the full marks on chordates. Most chordates are vertebrates, like yourself. But this is an invertebrate marine biology class, and we are going to be looking at things like this. So we're chordates ourselves, and we're very closely related to this uh, dock snot. Also beautiful colors of solitary sea squirts like this one. Colonial sea squirts like these, or the, oh, sorry, aggregated sea squirts like these, not colonial. There's another close up picture. These ones are colonial sea squirts. They share the same outer covering with many, many individuals, much like we saw with Cnidarians. Sea squirts and salps don't have a backbone. They are invertebrates, although they are in the phylum chordata. But at some stage have the four distinguishing characteristics of the chordates. These are ones that are all chordates have, including yourself. Let's have a look. Number one, you'll need to know all four of these uh, distinguishing characteristics. They have a notochord. All right, that is the main support of the body. In us, we have a spinal column that has been evolved, that has evolved, which is a skeletal. And these ones, they have a notochord. The second one is a dorsal hollow nerve cord. So that is the nerve cord that is uh, made up of uh, nerve cells that um, send the signals along the length of the body to organize movement and other nervous processes. They have gill slits, and you do as well when you're a very young embryo in your mom's tummy. You have gill slits. All chordates have gill slits. They're retained in uh, many of them, like fish. And they have a post-anal tail. Okay, I'll get my pen up. So I'll go with um, red. So at, for all of the other animals that we've looked at, the tail is at the very end of the body. You might have um, appendages sticking off the end. Uh, you might have like a telson and neuropods or something like that sticking off the end, but the, the anus is always right here. Okay? In the chordates, the po it's a post-anal tail. Just think of where the um, rear end is in a fish. Okay, and although all chordates have these four characteristics, uh, some of them retain them only for the larval stage, and that's the case for most of the ones that we're going to be looking at, uh, most of the inverts that we will be looking at in this course. So you're going to be responsible for two different um, classes, the Ascidiaceans, or the Ascidiacea, and the Thaliacea, the Salps. So the Ascidiacea are the benthic ones stuck to the bottom, and the Thaliacea are the planktonic ones. Okay, Cecil, that means stuck to the bottom, they don't really move around. The compound ones that are um, made up of a colonial grouping of the individual zoids, and they look like this. Okay, we have, let's grab our pen. Um, let's go with white. So this animal here, or this whole animal here, or is actually a, colo a colony of many, many zoids, and each of the zoids is has an opening right here, one of these little holes. They are the opening for each of the zoids. Okay, and again, you can say right here, the opening for each of the little zoids. This is a colonial animal. And once again, 
opening right here. So you can see the different zoids grouped together to make uh, the colony. So they could be, uh, as well as colonial, they may be solitary, such as a sea tulip. This one was taken at the now removed artificial sea surf reef that never really got completely built at Tay Street. So in the Ascidia scenes, they don't have the notochord, nerve cord, or postanal tail in the adult stage. Um, they are attached to the substrate, so they're the benthic ones, as we've said, and they have a tough, rubbery uh, outer coating called a tunic for protection, and that's why you'll often hear the term tunicate. And here's a sort of general picture of what these things might look like. They've got one place where the, um, get my pen up, here we go, where the water goes in. And if you remember the term buccal, that has to do with the mouth, right? Buccal from like the buccal, buccal tentacles from the, the uh, sea cucumbers. Okay, the water goes in to the buccal siphon and then winds up coming out the atrial siphon comes out of the atrium, which is the inner area. So in a sponge, this would be called the osculum. This is the atrial siphon in tunicates. Uh, it can be soft and gelatinous or tough and rubbery. And as we know what happens to bags of meat on the bottom, they have to have defenses because otherwise they'll be grazed out. So generally, they're tough and they're also very bad tasting. Um, the water goes into something called the pharynx or pharyngeal basket. And here is what a generalized or a cartoon almost uh, picture of one would be. So you can see the water coming in with all these particles of food coming in along with it. It goes down into this basket on the inside, and then it goes back. As you, you can see, the arrow goes through this basket. It's like a colander, and you can see all the little bits of food right here getting stuck onto the basket, working their way down to the mouth, and then into the intestines, the stomach, and then uh, you can see through the intestine. And as it turns to black, that uh, shows the waste going out with the exiting water current going out through the outside of the, uh, out through the atrial siphon. Okay, so the pharyngeal basket has cilia and it works just like the gills that we saw in bivalves. There's another picture where, uh, which is much more detailed in terms of the labeling. Now you don't need to know all of this, but you can see how um, complex this animal is with fully developed organs, ovaries, testes, heart, stomach, digestive glands, um, the pharyngeal basket, all of these different organs. So it's not um, as simple as some of the earlier filter feeders we saw. And you can see a nice picture of the pharyngeal basket in here. You can see all the lattice work that uh, goes into um, making up this pharyngeal basket that is a filtering organ. Okay, you can have them uh, in as, as solitary individuals or they may be um, the colonial ones. And in which case, in the colonial ones, they share the outer tunic and they probably will have a shared atrial opening. So you can see the multiple buccal siphons here and then they share one atrial siphon. So if we have our little thing, we can outline one zoid right here. And they're packed in and that's what, how you recognize these. Because otherwise they often look like sponges. But if you see this um, arrangement, then you know you're looking at a uh, colonial tunicate. 
So they broadcast sperm, spawn sperm and then brood eggs, very much like we saw with um, uh, sponges. And then the larva with all four uh, chordate characteristics swims out and then settles. And they also produce the, uh, the colonies or aggregations by budding. So here's what happens when they settle. Okay, so this is stage one, two, three, four. And you can just see how they develop the tunic and the gill slits become the pharyngeal basket or the, yeah, the pharynx. Uh, if we go to the uh, planktonic ones, we're looking at the salps or the thousand. Uh, they tend to be transparent and this one is a nice picture of what you um, are probably used to seeing if you go to the beach people often think see these things and think they're jellyfish eggs wa uh, washed up obviously that's um, swimmers or di scuba divers in the distant background they're not as uh, smaller than the than the salps these things will fit on the side on on your hand you can see the um, little brown spots, which make them look like kind of like a, an egg. Those are the food uh, that they filter being digested in the stomach cavity. Here's a nice picture of one. You're probably used to. Okay, so here's how they work. They work almost exactly the same as a as a colonial or a benthic one, but what happens is the water comes with all the particles comes in one end and then they close this end and then they open this end and shoot water out and so it's like a it's just like a jet boat or something so these things will move through the water in the direction that they suck the water in and jet it out at the rear end. You can see the muscular bands going around the body. And here you can see the pharyngeal basket, which is a beautiful filtering organ. You can see all the filters coming out of it. And then all of the ascent, uh, here is the gut, which is digesting all the food and little bag of organs. And so um, you can see how this thing works uh, very similarly to the benthic ones. So they're just like the benthic ones, except for they are planktonic, as we've said. Um, you'll probably have uh, seen these as you've been diving and swimming. Uh, they you often see them drifting past as you're as you're on your safety stops. Um, they are super abundant in Antarctic waters and, and transport a lot of carbon and nutrients out of the, uh, uh, the surface waters as their, their poo sinks down. So their fecal pellets move massive amounts of carbon dioxide out of the, out of the atmosphere into the deep waters of the ocean. Places where the krill have been fished out, these things will uh, bloom and um, can wind up replacing krill, which can have uh, food chain effects up to all of the things like um, uh, penguins and the like that we think of as the, uh, the, the big animals down there. And these are the fastest reproducers, faster than any other planktonic filter feeder. So they can reproduce sexually by broadcast spawning, as we said before, or they also bud off into those chains, into long, long chains, as we saw before.